Hi, and welcome back to Damn Parenting, your English-speaking parenting podcast from Amsterdam, the Netherlands. This month, it's all about schools. You'll have heard from us in our Damn Chats episode 23, where myself and Marin shed light on the experiences of getting ready for the new school year for the first time with our little ones. In episode 60, we welcome back Isabel Cruz from Consulting Kaleidoscope. This time, she's talking to us from a teacher's perspective, giving us some valuable insights as we get ready for the new school year. Damn Chats episode 24, we did a journaling exercise. The transitional period is very valuable for our children, but it's equally as valuable for us so that we are prepared as well as parents. Dr. Naomi is back on episode 61 in her residential position to talk to us about anxiety in parenthood and about how we're going to be able to manage that as we start the new school year. And so today we wanted to really hit back on some very important topics. And one of them is episode 30 school and languages as an international family with Eowyn from on raising bilingual children. In this episode, you're going to discover invaluable insights on how to seamlessly integrate multiple languages into their educational experiences. Eowyn sheds light on strategies for maintaining fluency in home languages while embracing the linguistic diversity of the school environment. So we hope you enjoy. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Damn Parenting, your English-speaking parenting podcast from Amsterdam. And you know this by now. My name is Maren, and I have my lovely co-host, Eva, with me, as always. It's a Wednesday, so we are dropping another expert episode. And because you all have gone through the roof with the last one that we recorded with Eowyn, who is our linguist expert, we thought because today is International Day of Multilingualism, we will just have Eowyn back to talk about the next language, not language, but topic that is linked to language. And we had a lovely chat with her about we are entering school now. So both Eva and my daughter are going to school this year. And we thought, let's sit down with Eowyn and ask her a couple questions. What are the things that we have to consider and watch out for? and address when we are entering the Dutch school system. And we had a lovely chat as always with her. Lots of wisdom. We hope this episode is going to go through the roof like the last one did. Anything to add, Eva? No, I kind of just wish I knew this last year. We are having so many episodes right now where we think, oh, yeah, we are in the we are in this phase now. But then they all give us all the information we would have needed last year before we would have entered this stage. So agree with this totally. But this is for so our you, listeners. Yes, exactly. We're not doing this for us, right? No, no. But hopefully this will help a lot of people out there who will be sending their kid to school, to primary school here in the Netherlands. And now they know what to look out for. So enjoy this amazing interview with Eowyn. And we are delighted to have back with us again, Eowyn from On Raising Bilingual Children. Good morning. Good morning. It's delightful to be back. Thank you so much for joining us. So today's episode, uh, as we said, Eowyn's actually going to speak to us about sending our children off to school, which will mean that they're now going to be surrounded with a lot longer potentially in the Dutch language. And our last episode with Eowyn, which honestly was the quickest to scale hit number one episode about our home language, this obviously is going to also resonate with so many parents out there as school starts at any day during the year because the school system here is your child's four, happy birthday. Next day, off you go to school. Eowyn herself actually brought this up on the last episode. She said, you know, this is actually also a very key pivotal moment we should discuss as well about that transitional period. And so, Eowyn, let's get the ball rolling. How about we, we discuss, first of all, what are some common challenges that the our little toddlers are going to face when starting a school in Dutch language, which is going to be different to our home language? Yeah, I mean, I guess the scope of challenges for children ranges from social, emotional through to academic and linguistic. And it's really important to recognize that we have this mythical idea of children as language sponges and that they should just be fine and we'll drop them in and they'll soak up the language. But it isn't that straightforward for all children. In fact, it's not really that straightforward for any children. And so I think the first really important thing to recognize is that we are adding a level of challenge to our children's education by putting them into school in another language. That's not to say it's not the right thing to do, but we need to recognize it and support them effectively if we want to give them every chance for success. And so part of that is just recognizing that it is indeed 
not an easy situation for many children to be dropped into a school where they don't speak the language and they can't play with kids and they can't say, I'm hungry or I need the toilet. And so we can talk about, you know, immediate strategies for helping our kids communicate. And then we can talk about more widely what that means in terms of language development and acquisition over time. Both are equally important. But the bottom line is that if they don't acclimate well, they'll struggle across the board and other things. That's kind of sad to hear straight off the bat, but okay. (laughs) Which is not to say it's not a good choice to make and that it doesn't bring many benefits. We just need to recognize that those benefits in part are dependent on giving them the kind of support they need to thrive rather than just expecting that it will all be fine and we don't need to do anything. And so although I do kind of chastise parents occasionally for, you know, pretending it'll be easy, it's more because the, the extent and the depth of the support we give them will have a significant impact impact on how they experience it. And on the last episode, we talked so much about how important it is so that when they acquire a new vocabulary or getting further in the other language that we always provide the context. So is it then useful if before they go to school, we kind of practice with them the sentences that they should say or the vocabulary? Or is this then because it doesn't really have a context and they can't really apply it that it doesn't even do anything? Or should we prepare them with this vocabulary beforehand? Less than preparing them with vocabulary is preparing them for the experience, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, in in a very kind of child-friendly four-year-old way that you're going to be going to school and that people are going to speak in different ways. You know, many children if not most, have had some exposure to Dutch before they start school age. You know, they've been to play groups or Petrus Beelzaal, or you know, it's not completely brand new to them. Yeah. So just discussing it in terms of, you know, you've been to swimming lessons and they this is how they say things to help them make those connections with where they've already heard it is important. And then I think more than preparing the child, it's preparing the teachers. And so it is really important for teachers to know about your child, what they like, what they can do, how strong they are in their own language, because we do know that children who come into school as language learners tend to be underestimated because the teacher can't see how much they know about certain things. They presume they don't know it. Uh, And so I think really it's the relationship with the teachers we need to build so that less perhaps than supporting them in language development before they go in, it's how we support them in language development while they're learning Dutch at school. So that means, you know, having the story that they're reading at school and, and reading it at home in their own language, knowing that they're going to be talking about the seasons and talking about the seasons in your own language and, and helping them yeah, acquire a bit of vocabulary in Dutch. I mean, your job is never to be the Dutch teacher. Mm-hmm. But insofar as you can support your children in understanding what's going to be happening in Dutch, then they can kind of open up to being able to learn the words to go with it. But you can imagine being sat in a class and the teacher's talking about something and you don't know what she's talking about and you don't know the words it's in. You're not learning anything. But if you know that the teacher's talking about seasons and you know what seasons are in English or in German or in Polish then you can be listening for those words in Dutch and you can learn them. And so it's about that scaffold, if you will, that they have at home through the home language to the school content that's really, really important in supporting the language development. Yeah, it's so great that you repeat this again because it's such a big shift to make in my mind where you where I think, oh, I need to prepare them in, in Dutch and I give them and do all that. But I now remember that you said exactly this in the last episode, that the home language is the base for everything. And that makes, yeah, again, total sense that I then would be talking about the seasons in German and then she gets the oh, we talk about the seasons. Oh, this is then the Dutch layer on top of it. Thanks. Yeah. So thank you again for this yeah. reminder, because this is so hard in my head to to understand. But it, of course, makes so much yeah, sense. It's just a basic principle. Knowledge in one language transfers to another. Yeah. So yeah, if I sure. know something in Dutch, I know it in any language. I just need the words. If I know something in German, I know it in any language. They don't have to recreate knowledge. They mm-hmm. only have to recreate the new words and structures for that knowledge in a new language. I actually love that. I'd love to print that off. <laughs> That's such a good yes. quote to have. Are there any differences in language acquisitions between the toddlers who start learning a second language at home versus those who started in school? 
I mean, yes, there there are always differences depending on the age of acquisition, but it's less about, you know, we need a lot of language input in order to develop it robustly. And so, you know, doing 15 minutes of Dutch a day isn't going to make a substantive difference to a child who's not been exposed to Dutch before going to school. You'd need to do, you know, hours of Dutch a day. And so really looking at the home situation, what are the languages of the home, how much time and effort is needed to develop those, and getting that right first without you don't want to take away time from a bilingual home in order to learn the school language when that can be done effectively at school. But if you have Dutch in your home, then of course your child is not a, you know, a newbie to Dutch, if you will. They're not a beginner to Dutch when they start at Dutch school. Depending on which parent speaks Dutch, they may be stronger in Dutch or stronger in the other language, but they, they wouldn't be considered a Dutch as a second language or an additional language learner if they've had it in the home from birth. It would be considered one of their first languages. And so kind of contextually and in terms of the research that that is different but the bottom line is rich rich input helps language acquisition happen and so whatever the the child's position in terms of their dutch development when they start school in dutch they just need lots of rich dutch for it to develop to develop and they need teachers who understand how to bridge from language to language they need approaches that let them give an answer in their own language and then they figure out what it is in dutch and so it's really about the in inclusive atmosphere of the classroom that that helps children acclimate and draw on their prior learning. And so from my perspective, one of the most important things to do if you're going to have children start school in that position where they'll be learning the school language as well is to choose your school carefully. Yeah, myself and Maren have both gone through that step of having chosen our school. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Are there any red or green flags that we can look out for in, look, let's say, like an intake interview or when we go to like a information day or something yeah something where we can already get a little sense of what's going on or Absolutely. how this language is <laughs> yeah <laughs> So uh, just ask the question how many multilingual children do you have in your school Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if they know, that's a good thing. And if they don't, it's not. But it's also sometimes how they phrase their discussion. Yes, you know, we have the, we have the problem of multilingual learners in our school. Okay, that's a bad thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's also looking at what we call the linguistic landscape of the school. Does the school look like the students? So if they have multilingual children, is that visible in the landscape of the school? Do they have displays that show the, the languages the children speak? Do they, you know, encourage parents to use their own language? There are lots of kind of soft questions we can, we can ask, but there are still schools that have, you know, even visible signs that say here, alle Nederlands praten. So oh, wow. That, yeah, okay. wow. there are. So obviously, if you see that, that's not a good thing. If the teachers or the people who are giving you the tour express curiosity about your children's language profiles, that's important. So schools can have two different approaches to multilingualism. We call them language policies. Doesn't mean they have a written policy, but they can have an additive policy, which, which sounds like this. So your child speaks German at home. That's great. We think German's really great. We want your child to keep speaking German. Look, we have some German books and here are some other German children. And we'd like you to come in and read in German to the children. We want to add Dutch to your child's German. So that's an mm -hmm. additive policy. Mm -hmm. We want your child to keep what they have and we're adding Dutch. A subtractive policy can sound on the surface quite similar, but it diverges in one key way. So they might say, we think German is great. We want your child to keep speaking German. German is obviously really important for them to use at home. But here at school, we want them to learn Dutch. So that's what we call a subtractive policy. We want to replace here at school your child's German with Dutch. And so children tune into those messages and they use it to assess the, the relative value of their languages. So a language has value if the people around my different contexts value it. So if my teachers think German is cool and can I help them learn to say good morning in German, then obviously German has value. But if my teachers say to me, you shouldn't be using German at school, you should only use Dutch, then my German doesn't have value. That child perception of the status of their languages plays very heavily into their choice to either continue using it or to try and learn Dutch quickly and stop using it. And so we know that has a really significant impact on, on development. And so it's just looking for anything that will give you insight into that school. Do they have an additive or a subtractive policy when it comes to students' other languages? And it can be different by language. So languages that are considered high status, French, English, German, might be treated very differently than languages that are considered low status, which are by and large in the Netherlands, Turkish, Arabic, Polish, 
Romanian, etc. Which I wish I could speak because you know, they're very <laughs> hard to learn. Any the, anyone who can speak them without going through actually like sitting down and learning them is blessed in, yeah. in my opinion. So, Are there any common misconceptions or concerns parents should be aware of regarding the bilingual children's language development as they're going through Dutch schools? So I think the first really important thing is that vocabulary development is by and large divergent in multilingual learners. That means they don't necessarily know the same words in every language. They learn a word because they happen to need it in that context. And so that means they'll have words in the home language that they don't have in school language, and they'll have words in the school language that they don't have in the home language. Very often in schools, particularly in the Netherlands, and I would say particularly in Amsterdam, there's been a tendency to measure children's vocabulary at certain points to decide on their progression. So can they go to group three? Do they have the vocabulary they need? But if they measure that vocabulary only in, in Dutch, of course, children who don't live in Dutch will measure underperforming because they don't know words about, for example, the kitchen or the lounge or the living room in Dutch. And so it's really being very clear with your child's school about their language development in their own language. And that idea of, you know, really getting the whole picture of a child's development requires looking at their vocabulary across languages and not only in the school language. And so that's a big piece of the kinds of the advocacy conversations we need to have because schools will measure you know, they'll have a list of whatever 75 words children should know by this age, and they expect them to know them all in Dutch. And that's not reasonable or effective as a measure. Do you think that's a question we could put to the school? Absolutely. Because what happens is, um, I wrote a blog post about it years ago. In in the Netherlands, they have, so in Dutch, a word which is tal achterstand, which means to have a language delay. But they use that same word for children who come into Dutch schools not as Dutch speakers. They have a tal achterstand. And because they are using the same word for the diagnosis as for the language development piece, there's a lot of misconceptions about bilingualism being bad for children, that it causes a language delay, that it, that you need to stop using your home language in order to develop their Dutch, which is, of course, absolutely not true. And so it's really being clear that your child, if your child is developed in any language to the right age, they do not have a language delay. They don't have a tal achterstand. That is a specific feature of some children who have cognitive, neurolinguistic, or physiological challenges to do with language. But if a child is four years old and can use English at, at a you know an appropriate level for a four-year-old child, they don't have a tal achterstand. They may be developing their Dutch. They may be Dutch language learners. And so it's really making sure that in our conversations with the school, we don't let them conflate those two things. Because what ends up happening is parents who hear that, oh, my child has a language delay. I'm, I'm so worried. What should we do? And then the school says, well, you should start start speaking Dutch at home to help them. So they take that advice. And it still happens really commonly. It's not, it's not uh, you know, infrequent at all. And then you end up with a child whose home language starts to slow down in its development and that has a negative knock-on effect on their development of Dutch as well. And so it goes back to, I think we talked a little bit about last time, you do need to know the research a little bit, because otherwise when the school says, oh, your child has a tall achterstand, everybody gets worried and all the wrong things happen. Whereas if you know, actually you say, no, my child doesn't have a tall achterstand. They are a Dutch language learner, but it's not an achterstand. And just that level of you know precision that you're able to bring to the conversation can help avert some of the really quite common misdiagnoses and, and mis treatment of multilingual children in schools. So speaking of that, that was something you did mention, as you said, in the previous episode, you said about, well, research says, you know, yes. <laughs> using that to empower ourselves and to advocate for ourselves. Can you find a light on any research findings on any long-term academic or sociocultural outcomes of children who were actually educated in any different language than their home language that we could actually use? So, I mean, there's lots of research on young bilinguals. It's really, you know, it's important to understand context as well. So, for example, one of our largest bodies of research on children who learn a new language at school is on Canadian children who go to French immersion. So they're English speaking children. They go through French immersion. How does it impact their learning? And we know that overall it's really positive, but that's very different than, you know, a German Swedish child going to school in a Dutch school. 
And so we also need to be aware to not over extrapolate research. But we do know by and large, going to school in another language doesn't have any necessary negative effect for children, as long as they're given the proper support. We do know there's a lot of kind of noise out there about cognitive benefits of bilingualism and that it will make children smarter and that it will make them better thinkers and decision makers. That research is actually much less substantive than the interwebs likes to you know, present it as. There seem to be potentially some cognitive benefits, but what those specifically are are and at what level of bilingualism they accrue, we don't know. And so I encourage parents to move away from expecting cognitive benefits and to recognize that actually there are linguistic benefits to learning another language at school when you're younger, and there are social benefits. And so the linguistic benefits are, especially if you're living in the Netherlands, well, you get to participate in Dutch life because you learn Dutch to a very high level going to school in Dutch. That's really, really important. So that's, for me, the first and most important benefit. Aside from that, we know that children who are bilingual from a younger age have a tendency, tendency, not a guarantee, to be better at learning new languages later in life as well. So there seems to be some kind of positive effect that if my brain has managed, you know, to cognitively sort out two languages at a young age, I'm better at it later on as well. You know, if they do want to go on and learn other languages, that they'll have an advantage. There's also social benefits from becoming bilingual at a younger age that are to do with the way that children interact with the world around them, the way they treat people who are different than them, the way they communicate, all of those other benefits. And so overall, it's a it's a really good choice to make. We just need to be sure that we're providing our children with the support to be successful and not just relying on that hopeful analogy that they'll be a sponge and soak it up. It's always that sponge element that people are like, oh, children are sponges. They can do everything. I also was under the illusion of if you're able to pick up a second language at a very young age, it makes you more adaptable to be able to speak languages. That's always been an assumption. But I can attest to not being one of those <laughs> because yeah. I had Irish and English growing up. And then I was thrown into French and German um, when I hit like 12, 13. Actually, French was even earlier. And yeah, I'm and I lived in all the different countries and I can definitely tell you it does not work. It's not a guarantee for any child or every child. Not a guarantee. It's a, like a statistical probability, but that's very, very different <laughs> from being the kind of guarantee that people think it is, that there's some kind of magical thing that happens to your brain that means you'll absolutely be an outstanding language learner just because you became bilingual at a younger age. And you're right, it's, there's still a lot of individual difference. I, I can definitely attest as well to the fact that I think it is down to context and it's down to support in the home environment. What you were mentioning earlier, that if you're learning the seasons in school in Dutch, for example, at home, I really need to be providing that in English. And if I bring in Irish into it, because you're given a level playing field then. And so you're supporting right. them in all aspects. And so, yeah, that's I think my only problem is I'm going to be that annoying parent going to the school going, and what's on the curricular this month? You know, tell me what you're going to be doing. <laughs> So you are going to a, to a parent-involved school then after, or you're just making it your, your own parent-involved school? It, it's probably not a parent-involved school, and I'm just <laughs> yeah. going to make it a parent-involved school. They're going to be asking you me to leave. You want to look at the, the Waldorf again then? If you're ready, so. <laughs> oh. Um, <laughs> so well, one thing that I have picked up, and it's so so sweet that, so my husband doesn't speak Dutch, and when he when my daughter brings him a Dutch book, and in the beginning it was very... She said, oh, daddy, that sounds very funny how you say these words. But then she kind of picked it up and she's like, let's practice. She said, let's practice. And then after a page, she said, good job, Papa, good job. Let's let's practice. So she already knows that it's good and you get better with practice. And she does have that positive effect also from daycare where they let her speak German if she needs to, but then they give her the word and say, okay, let's practice this again. And she already has adapted this fashion of this is how we learn a language we practice. Yeah. And then, yeah, that's how we learn it. That's outstanding because that those are the kinds of skills that we should be focusing on more, that she she's paying attention to people's communicative needs, that she's recognizing that, oh, daddy doesn't really, you know, this isn't his particular, his forte, so I'm going to help him and I'm going to cheer him on. You know, yes. all of those things are really that to me is the gift of bilingualism that we give our children because we do know that it's much harder if you're raised as a monolingual to have that kind of communicative empathy because you don't really get why people don't get it because you've not 
been an, you're not an experienced language learner yourself and so it's that communicative empathy i think that's really important and it's great that your husband is embarking on that because what he's showing to her is even though i don't speak dutch i value dutch and i'm willing to give it a go yeah. so he's putting himself in, you know in a situation of vulnerability as a learner which often parents really struggle with. And so they send their kids to school to learn Dutch, but they're not learning Dutch themselves. <laughs> and so they go to the cheese shop and they order in English and they go to the butcher and they order in English. And yet at the same time, they're saying to their child, well, you're going to go to school in Dutch and I really want you to learn Dutch. And so that's exactly the kind of disposition we need is what your husband is showing that he's modeling just because I can't do this well doesn't mean A, I'm not going to give it a go and B, it's not important for me. So yeah. Kudos to him. So that raises a question for me now when you're saying that is a case of, I don't know if this is going back 10 steps to one language, one parent kind of topic, but it's just a case of we should not be speaking it another language in case we're speaking it incorrectly to the child. Yeah, total myth. Oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> language is not about being correct. Language is about so much more than being correct. I mean, when you go to the cheese shop, they're less focused on your grammar and more focused on the on the fact that you're giving it a try. And that shows respect. And that shows, you know, that you know where you're living. And it shows you're modeling to your daughter that, you know, it's good to give it a go in Dutch. And so I think that, you know, we as parents, we need to you know, we need to be show positive role models of language acquisition and we need to show what we do when it's tricky and we need to show how we give it a go anyway. Especially with Dutch, your kids are going to be going to Dutch school. They're going to hear loads and loads of correct Dutch. And I would even argue that correct Dutch varies according to where you are. So not mm -hmm. everybody speaks the same variety. And so there are there are so many messages that can be sent by parents being willing to embark on language learning with their children that outweigh any particular issue with the accent on a particular word or how they pronounced something. So least of your worries. I, I do want to point, though, for all the years I'm living in Amsterdam, I can definitely, you know, stand up here and say, I've been trying to do the Dutch. I've learned it. I've done so many different ways of doing it. And when I go into that cheese shop, as you would say, or for me, it's fruity guy at the yep. market. He doesn't care that I'm trying to speak Dutch. He just wants it over and done with as quickly as possible. So he replies in English and goes, yeah, there you go. Off you go. Bye. And he knows me <laughs> and he still keeps talking English to me. And I'm like, dude, like, you know, Please. come on. Yeah, <laughs> but this is the problem. This is the problem we do have in Amsterdam is we will get immediately the response will turn Perfect. to English and then they kind of just continue on. Even if we are totally adamant in continuing that in Dutch, they just want you out of the shop off next next person. Yeah, no, I know exactly what you mean. And so in fact, when we first moved to The Hague, we lived in an area like that. Uh, we lived there for the first, I guess, year and a half we were there. And then we we bought a place and we particularly bought it in a place that didn't have very many expats because I really wanted to be able to use Dutch. And uh, I think we'd been living there about 10 years and I'd been using Dutch in all the shops and I was working really hard on my Dutch and, and my parents came to stay for a while. And I said to my mom, how are you managing to go shopping on our shopping street? Because nobody speaks English. She's like, oh, yeah, they all speak English. Like they do, because they never used English with me. And so it's also about where you're living That's um, true. Uh, that, that I can can make a difference. And so it was absolutely true. All these shopkeepers that I thought couldn't speak a word of English, they were like chit chatting with my parents in English. <laughs> It was oh. good for me. But, you know, you can try saying to your fruity guy, listen, fruity guy, I'm trying really hard to, to learn Dutch. And I know it's easier for you to, 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 to speak to me in English. So if I come when it's a bit quieter, could you give it a go in Dutch for me? Have those conversations. Does that have to be in English or in Dutch? You can have that in English. <laughs> you can say, come on, okay. I'm, I'm doing my best. Please help me. And, yeah. and hopefully he will. Or you I, need I, to find a new fruity guy. I, well, yeah, I, I friend fruity woman actually now we been in the different area, <laughs> but I do have to say, I do feel like a lot of expats or international families living here, if they've been living here for a few years and they really get into it and they're really adamant and they're so like dedicated to learning Dutch, it's people like this who really keep knocking you off a peg and they keep like, you're living in a city where there's 180 nationalities and most people are going to speak English. And so I think that's where we struggle that we're trying to speak Dutch and yeah. then we keep getting English back and then we kind of just end up giving up and then we just resort to English. No, absolutely. And, you know, it it is hard as an adult to go out and mediate the parts of your life in a language you're not particularly comfortable with. And so we do often go, OK, well, 
if that's why you want to do it, that's actually easier for me. But, you, you know, there's a kind of a, a, a contradiction, if you will, I think, happening in particular in Amsterdam right now, but it, with the expats in the, in the Netherlands in general, where there's more pressure from some bodies for people to learn more Dutch, but the society in which you live is not really supporting that. And so it, it is a contradiction. And so I think, yeah, having the conversations with the people you shop with and just asking them to, you know, please, can you help me out a bit, might be a way forward with some of them anyway. The fact that you're starting in Dutch is a good model for your child, that you didn't walk in and use English right away. Oh, she's not with me. In English? That's the problem is because I'm, I don't want to do it around her because half the time, if my husband reads in English, she'll turn around and go, She's. I think I said this the last time, is like he was reading an English book and there was very, very old terminologies used in it and he mm-hmm. couldn't understand the words. So he just said a different word by mistake and she turned around and she goes, Mama, Papa, can he laser? Like, Mom, Dad can't read, you know? And it's because it was a book I was constantly reading and I was, yeah. I think I'm afraid of my daughter giving out to me, maybe that's what it is. Well, but then you need to set up better family language conversations about language learning. Then you need to, you know, just, I mean, she's old enough to have those conversations. Yeah. you. So your daddy isn't an English speaker and it's not his strongest language. And so he's reading a book in English with you. So you got to be proud of him for giving a go. And when I go to the cheese shop and I order in Dutch, you know, that's not my comfortable language, but we all sometimes have to, you know, make, we make mistakes because that helps us learn. And so that is a conversation you need to start having with your daughter because she needs to become an empathetic empathetic language partner for you and for your husband rather than a a, a judgmental one. (laughs) An empathetic toddler. Never knew this. Um, (laughs) Start now and she'll develop into one. True. (laughs) Going back to the school. So we've discussed about entering into school at the age of like four or five and how you've given some great tips about when we're even viewing schools to kind of ask them about that language area, how we can actually see it through our own eyes as well. And equally, we discussed as well parallel learning, as it were, where they learn the seasons in school, they can learn the seasons back with us. If we progress a little further, are there any specific challenges or adjustments bilingual children may actually encounter as they go on from the early years, those grade one and two into grade three, four, five and beyond? So, I mean, there there are various things that happen in schools that provide an additional level of challenge for children who are multilingual. So the, the first of those is literacy. So it's one thing to be learning to, to speak a language at school, and then all of a sudden you need to learn to read and write that language. And we know that a really good thing about the Dutch school system is that they teach reading and writing in Groupe Rie, which is the right age to teach reading and writing. So six to seven is when most children are cognitively ready for reading. And that gives children who come in in group one two years just to learn Dutch before they need to learn to read in Dutch. And that's hugely beneficial. However, it doesn't mean that in two years, they're going to be functioning at the same level as a Dutch speaking child. So they're still learning to read with a lower level of vocabulary development and a not as well developed understanding of the Dutch sound system. And so it is the case that sometimes kids will seem to lag behind in early literacy skills which is just a fact of their, you know, their their situation of being language learners. It's nothing to do with whether or not they're able to be literate. And so there may be more conversations to have with your children's teachers there about, you know, making sure that, are, you know, if they want to say your child has a reading difficulty, what are they basing that on? And is it on more than just they're not reading at the same level as a Dutch child because your children shouldn't be measured against Dutch children? They should, you know, they, they are still learning Dutch. And so those conversations might pop up around literacy just in terms of what it's like to become literate in a language that you're not fluent in yet. And so it's just something to keep an eye on and to, again, any kind of messages of concern from the school need to be mediated through the, how did you decide that? What measure did you use for that? If they've just used the same measure that they used to measure all Dutch children learning to read, well, that's not going to be an efficient measure for a child who's still learning Dutch. Now, the good news is that because they do have some time just to learn language, they've had, you know, maybe not enough time to catch up, but maybe a substantive amount of time to learn vocabulary. But that doesn't mean that all children will perform to age level expectations in the first two or three years of literacy. So that's kind of the first challenge that you might need to be having good conversations with the children's teachers and talking about 
you know, there are other languages that they speak and how that influences their Dutch. For example, English and Dutch use the same alphabet, but the spelling conventions are very different. And so they might not have like a full library of Dutch sounds, if you will, which means when they're being taught what those Dutch sounds look like in terms of letter combinations, they don't quite get it because they don't have the O oh yet or the <laughs> yet. And then the second kind of area of challenge comes towards the end of primary school with the Cito Toots. So you guys are parents of young children. You probably don't even know what the Cito Toots yet is. But the Cito Toots is a test that all Dutch children do at the end of primary school. It's a wide ranging test of their Dutch language skills, their mathematical skills. And it is used to decide what which of the three levels of secondary school they should go to. And it is an extremely Dutch test. <laughs> And so like some of the vocabulary is quite old fashioned. It's not the kind of vocabulary you would come across unless you have a Dutch grandmother. But also, you know, we, we know that the spread of time it can take children to learn a new school language is five to nine years. So five to nine years in Dutch schooling to become academically proficient in Dutch to the same level that a Dutch child would be. And so that means there are children who at the end of primary school may still be in that developmental phase where they're not kind of cognitively as strong yet in Dutch as Dutch speaking children. And so they underperform on that test. And so it seems to be kind of cognitive that they should go to a Mavo, but actually is also just language related. And so again, school choice is important because teachers have some sway in some schools about making those what they call an advice on where a child goes to school next. Some schools only use the CETO toots, some also use teacher advice. The ones that use teacher advice are more likely to be able to mediate what the teacher knows about the child with how the child does on that particular exam to give them the correct advice. And so it seems like a weird thing to be worrying about when you have a four-year-old, <laughs> but it is something that will have a fairly you know, fairly long-term effect on your child. And we do know that statistically there are groups of children that are allocated to the lowest level rather than the higher levels. And those tend to be the immigrant minority language speaking children. So slightly depressing, but uh, hopefully. <laughs> but, get, but knowledge is power. Indeed. You know, and hopefully in the coming. Power, knowing that it's coming, hmm. knowing your child, knowing their trajectory it is really important in being able to mediate those discussions and to get your child into the right school for them. But it, I, I've worked with many, many families over the years who have children in Dutch education who have come across this to their surprise and not realize that actually their child won't get to choose what level of secondary school they go to. It is dictated by this particular test in a lot of schools. I've heard some bad stories about it. Yeah, unfortunately, the hope is that in the next five to 10 years, there might be a, a change or a reform of the system. But again, this is down to a government and we'll have to wait and see. One can hope. Yeah, drag them into the 21st century. I guess we're going to end this asking you for some of your golden nuggets and basically just going back to people considering their schools, essentially. So what advice would you actually have for parents who are considering sending their children to the local Dutch school of whatever education style they choose, where their language is actually going to be Dutch and it's different from their own home language? So I think you need to you need to recognize that your child may not for the first years perform in the way you think they're academically capable of because they're learning Dutch while they're learning content. And so don't put any pressure on them. You know, just expect that that will have an impact because it will. Be empathetic, talk to them about it, talk to their teachers about it. All of that's really important. I think, you know, choose your school wisely in terms of what you value, but also what the school values. So if you value your child's multilingual profile, then choose a school that also values that. That's really important. And I think be prepared to advocate. Again, know enough of the research that if somebody tries to tell you something about your child that you think is fundamentally untrue or unfair, that you have the knowledge or you know where to get the knowledge to push back against that, to make sure that your child is not in any way kind of measured against something they're not and found wanting. I think that that's really important is just that advocacy piece that we, we need to be prepared to have the hard conversations about our children's development. And they are hard because as parents, yeah. we obviously want the best for our kids. But at the same time, we are in a yeah. mesh of we're not understanding and we're trying to get a toddler or a child yeah. to kind of have a more adult outlook as well. But we can't expect that from them. And 
it's yeah, a and mesh. the only other thing that's kind of a really just a very strategic one is that I know that there's been a rise in bilingual primary schools in the Netherlands. Over the last years, I was involved in in, in the pilot project many, many years ago with some schools that say Talaga Primaire Onderwijs. International parents can be very tempted to put their child in an English Dutch bilingual school instead of Dutch only because they feel it'll be more friendly perhaps for them because English is spoken. But if you don't speak Dutch at home, and your long-term plan is the Netherlands, your child should go to a Dutch-only primary school so that they have all of that ample opportunity in primary school to, to build their Dutch to a really high level. If they're splitting their time across English and Dutch, their Dutch will take longer to develop and that will be to their detriment. And so I would say 100% Dutch for primary, and then you can choose a Dutch secondary school that is bilingual, but you know, don't make a choice about that that reflects your own comfort level educationally, make the right choice for your children. And for children who don't speak Dutch at home, the right choice is 100% Dutch primary school. Amen. Thought it is, is. Yeah, but yeah, it's exactly what you say. It's like, who am I choosing this school for? For myself or for my child who actually has to go there every single day and spend multiple hours there? Right. And, you know, if you if they have the cushion of English because they have English at home, they'll just concentrate their efforts in English and it'll take them a lot longer to learn Dutch. And that's absolutely to their detriment if you're going to be there long term. What if we flipped it then and said one parent is Dutch and the other parent is an English speaker? Is it the same advice? Then it's perfectly fine for them to go to a bilingual school because they have both at home. But, uh, you know, if they don't have Dutch at home, they should go to a 100% Dutch primary school. Okay. So that gives you a little bit of leeway. <laughs> <laughs> gives your child the best opportunity to learn Dutch as quickly as possible. And that's what they need. I, I just do find that there's a lot of international families here who sometimes they're here for a contract and then they might want to stay. There's, there's that whole unknowingness. And I think that's also a massive struggle for many people. Very few are definite and dedicated saying this is where we're going to stay and raise our children. So yeah, that's, that's uh, a great point. I understand, but you can move them later to an English speaking or a bilingual school, but you can't go back on that decision. <laughs> I think that's a, a great point and I think that's a great way to end this this conversation and this episode. And again, thank you so much. I mean, you're full of wisdom is the only way to put it. And you have not just wisdom and experience, but you actually have the research and you have the knowledge that comes with it. And you yourself, as you just said, you've actually been part of the government really setting up different kinds of yeah schools now, I guess, and policies um, that are dictated here in the Netherlands as well. So you created it and then you moved to England. <laughs> what are you doing over in England? <laughs> I didn't create it. I supported it. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you again. Yeah, we're going to be having to think of the next topic that we're going to have to get you back on for. <laughs> Always a pleasure. Super. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thanks. I can just keep talking with Eowyn for hours. And there it's will unbelievable. Always be, right? There will always be a topic that comes up and she will always have an amazing answer to it. And she will always just make so much sense of everything. My head is literally like one of these little things that you put the in nodding the nodding dogs. The nodding dogs. My head is just like, uh-huh. Yes. 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 You're right. Oh, yes. That makes so much sense. Why didn't I think of this before? Or... Oh my God, yes, I'm already doing this. So I just love having conversations with her. It's, it's also the fact that the way she speaks is just fact. That's it. This is how it yeah. is. There's no, oh, let me look into that for you. Or, oh, yeah, I, yeah. I wonder. It's just, no, I know this. Here you go. Yeah. This is what it is. What I really found so interesting, what she said about, and I have recognized now that I thought when I did the information morning at the school that my daughter will go to, what she said about the approach of, is it a, a subtracting or a additional approach to multilingualism? And now that I went back, I was like, oh my God, in my memory, oh, how was it? How was it? But I think I'm pretty sure that it was very welcoming and inclusive language environment. <laughs> yeah. And me, I'm panicking going... I cannot recall anything that even looked like even languages, to be honest, where I where I saw. So it's a really great point for people who are actually going to be looking at schools. So, I mean, definitely take that as a great empowering step forward. She had some great recommendations of advocating with empowerment, with knowledge. Always, always revert back to her previous episode with us, where if you're not feeling comfortable with people and they're telling you, well, this is what we do. You always use that powerful phrase. Well, actually, research shows and yes. that can knock people off their, you know, their heels. I started using this with my husband and like totally. Random <laughs> things. Actually, research shows. Research shows Domino's pizza is actually good for you. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> hi Harriet. Hi Harriet. Oh yes. <laughs> we did an episode with her about uh, nutrition, and and she is a wealth of knowledge when it comes to postpartum nutrition. And she said she loves a good Domino's pizza also, which so, still shocks no me. No shame on that. Yeah. Okay, but, but for this episode, found, oh yeah, one thing just to add, what I found really great that she mentioned that was the whole topic about the fall after stunt where she said yes it's not a developmental thing that your child has problems with yeah. acquiring a language but it's just a vocabulary thing that they don't have enough vocabulary yet so this was really a very important piece of information because this is so quickly thrown out there and then you go off and even as a parent I would if I would know this I would be like, oh God, so now maybe I should get a speech therapist. And then they sit with the child and they're like, well, there's nothing wrong. But then you go, but the school says that. And then you're like in this whole rabbit hole, mm. what's wrong with my child? Like, why does the school say this? The expert doesn't see a problem, but here we are. And it's still, this word is still in the room. So that was really important to pay attention to what is actually meant with that. And does the school use the right vocabulary to describe what's actually happening? Yeah. And also, I don't know if the, we spoke about this during the episode or if this was after, but it was that thing for me is it's the discomfort of my child going to school. And if they have a little question or a little struggle, can I help support them? Because if they come to me yeah. with, hey, you know, today we were learning about this and I'm thinking, OK, she has a question for me. Can I answer it? because mm. I'm not going to be sure of it because I'm really looking forward to history and geography and all those because those I love doing them in school myself and over here it's going to be very different history and probably different a little bit of different geography and I'm really looking forward to it but I do get very anxious about can I actually do that with her but then Eowyn actually said yeah but you just do it in English I mean at the end of the day it doesn't have to be parallel I did mention the word parallel learning it's actually not that at all you just yeah. do something along the same lines but it's all about words and context and that kind of learning that way. So I think that was actually quite reassuring for me, to be honest. And in fairness, children don't have homework or much learning anyway in Basel school. So this is not even for now. This is for a decade away. Yeah. Well, what hopefully is not a decade away is your click to the subscribe link. Because every Wednesday we are coming out with an expert episode on this podcast. And you can make sure that you don't miss any of the episodes when you subscribe to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Make sure to activate the bell so you get a notification when we drop another episode. Every Wednesday, we invite an expert to speak on a particular topic. And most Mondays, we drop a damn chats episode where Eva and I are chatting away about a topic that has come our way during the week. You can follow us on Instagram. Damn Parenting Podcast. Um, you can always write us an email or get in touch with us also on Spotify. It would be amazing and super helpful for us if you can rate us a five-star rating so we get seen and climb up those little letters to the app so a lot of people can get the content that we're putting out. And with that, we'll hear you on the next expert episode or the damn chats. And we hope you have an amazing week.